Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 5 of The Devil's Brood, The Death of the Air. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, Henry weathered the murder of Thomas Becket, the quarrelsome Archbishop of Canterbury, with only minor criticism from the papacy. So he turned his considerable energy towards expanding his influence, establishing dominance over Ireland, and using marriage alliances to finally compel the Count of Toulouse to pay homage. Henry was basking in his triumph when his eldest son rebelled, angry that he had been crowned King of England but lacked any actual land. Given Henry's rich experience of crushing revolts, a rebellious son was a minor matter. Except Henry the Younger was joined by his father-in-law Louis, the King of France, and the Counts of Flanders, Boulogne and Blois, and the King of Scotland, and the Earls of Leicester, Norfolk, Chester and Derby, and numerous barons in Normandy, Anjou, and Brittany, and his sons Richard and Joffrey, until it became clear that his wife Eleanor, Duchess of Aquitaine, was one of the organizers of this massive revolt. Given the size of the opposition, Henry's defeat seemed inevitable, but revenue from the mammoth trading zone within the Angevin territories enabled him to hire thousands of mercenaries while the government of England remained loyal. Also, he had more than his fair share of good luck. After more than a year of fighting, Henry had emerged victorious, forgiving all of his opponents to ensure stability and hopefully prevent future revolts. Henry had not only survived the Great Revolt, but he had become the most powerful monarch in Europe, having forced his main rival, Louis, the King of France, to ask for peace, and William the Lion, the King of Scotland, to bend the knee. Several years later, his situation improved further when the mighty Emperor Frederick Barbarossa lost a war against the Lombard League in 1176, losing much of his influence in southern Europe. Although the young king was not punished, he and his leading knights spent most of 1175 accompanying Hunt Henry as he traveled through England. Henry was likely showing his kingdom that the young king was loyal, while evaluating that loyalty. An added benefit of Henry's victory in the Great Revolt was the opportunity to have an open relationship with his lover, Rosamund de Clifford, since his disloyal queen had been imprisoned. Although she is considered to have been the love of his life, little is known about their relationship, which was relatively brief. At some time between 1174 and 1176, Rosamund retired to a nunnery, apparently to receive care for an illness because she died in 1176. Numerous legends appeared later blaming Eleanor for Rosamund's death, which is impossible since she was safely locked up at the time. More likely, Rosamund caught one of the many illnesses that could not be cured by the limited medical science of the time and died. Speaking of Eleanor, it appears that Henry considered annulling his marriage to her and possibly marrying Alice, Richard's betrothed. But he clearly did not go through with the plan, most likely because he would lose control of Akaten, and he would have no authority to keep Eleanor locked up. She would be free to start more trouble and even remarry. One solution would be to have Eleanor become abbess at her favorite abbey, Fontrevaux, thus removing her from the political equation while the position of abbess would be far more comfortable than house arrest in a castle, Eleanor refused because Henry would have the wealth of Akaten and he could keep Richard as his heir for as long as he wanted. In the end, the Archbishop of Gwent defied the king and refused to permit her to be forced into the abbey. Speaking of Alice, in September 1177, a papal legate threatened to place Henry's lands under interdict, unless Richard married Alice, or she was returned to her father. This melodramatic threat was the result of Louis' appeal to the Pope to force Henry to arrange the marriage. There had been rumors that she had become Henry's mistress, which would make any children born to Richard illegitimate, but Louis was probably just tired of waiting. 17-year-old Alice was a valuable marriage pawn who had been removed from the board for almost a decade, since the peace agreement at Montmartre in 1169. Pressured by the legate, Henry and Louis agreed that Richard would marry Alice, 
Both kings would go on crusade, and they would sign a peace treaty until they went on crusade. Having crushed the most independent-minded of the English earls, Henry was able to spread royal authority throughout England, while squeezing as much revenue as possible to refill his empty treasury, which would provoke further revolts. The reform of the legal system continued. Before Henry's reign, there was no single set of laws, and ecclesiastical, royal, and baronial courts competed for jurisdiction. Remember that the feud with Thomas Becket had been caused by the Constitutions of Clarendon, which stipulated that all crimes of murder, robbery, and theft would be tried by a traveling commission of royal judges and juries of 12 local men, thus assigning the maintenance of law and order to royal sheriffs and courts. Ten years later, Henry greatly expanded the legal system, adding arson, forgery, and counterfeiting to the royal court's responsibilities. Hoping to resolve the many land disputes that were causing trouble, he divided the kingdom into six circuits and judges would be sent along the circuits to try cases. Since the judges had been trained in the same legal system, they applied the same law across the kingdom. Furthermore, the royal council was reorganized in 1178 and five members of the council would always remain in Westminster to hear legal cases, creating England's Supreme Court. As a result, the crown began to play a more direct role in England through an efficient bureaucracy. Stability made everyone happy. Well, everyone except for the clergy and the barons, since both groups had lost a great deal of power. As I said earlier, the royal treasury had been drained by the Great Revolt and Henry wanted to refill it as soon as possible. So he seized every opportunity to take control of an estate. When Hugh Bogod, Earl of Norfolk, died during a pilgrimage in Palestine, Henry took advantage of a dispute between Bogod's son Roger and his second wife to place much of the Bogod estate under royal control and to even deny Roger the earldom of Norfolk. Actually, Henry's relentless efforts to weaken potential rivals and gain revenue would impact Richard's campaign to establish ducal control in Aquitaine. Reconciled with his father, 17-year-old Richard embraced the campaign, spending the year of 1175 learning the science of besieging castles. However, in the spring of 1176, Richard was opposed by a powerful coalition of nobles, which forced him to seek aid from his father. Oddly enough, the cause of the revolt was Henry himself. Reginald, Earl of Cornwall, had died in December. A strong supporter of Henry's mother Matilda during the anarchy and Henry during the Great Revolt, Reginald had ruled Cornwall as an autonomous region, but he had no son. His estate should have been divided among his daughters, but Henry repaid his uncle's decades of loyalty by giving the estate to his son John. Since John was 10 years old, Henry was able to claim the revenue from the thriving tin mines of Cornwall for himself. The eldest daughter had married Viscount Aymar of Limoges, who had remained faithful to the old king during the revolt. But Henry's decision to seize his wife's inheritance drove him to join the revolt against Richard. Money supplied by Henry enabled Richard to hire mercenaries, and he had driven the leaders of the revolt to surrender in September. By 1179, Richard had proven himself a master of siege warfare. Several of the major rebels left on crusade rather than remain in their lands, surrounded by ruined castles that were reminders of their lost independence. Actually, 1176 was a good year for John. Aside from gaining Cornwall, he was betrothed to Isabella, the youngest daughter of the powerful Welsh border lord William, Earl of Gloucester, who was the son of Robert of Gloucester and Matilda's loyal half-brother. William's other two daughters would only receive a fraction of the estate. The rest would go to John through his bride, thus neutering a loyal but powerful earl. John was available for matrimony because his former betrothed, Alice of Maurienne, had died when she was brought to England during the Great Revolt. So, what has the heir been doing? When his first child died at birth in the summer of 1177, the young king seemed to withdraw from the dynastic struggle and focused his energy on tournaments, where he could obtain a form of glory. Success did not come immediately, and his team had several embarrassing, expensive losses. Tournaments were safer than warfare, but not much. 
When I say tournaments, you probably think of two mounted knights charging at each other with lances in front of a huge crowd of people. Those are jousts, and they became popular a century later. What I'm talking about would better be described as competitive war games, fighting with real weapons, knights sometimes died or were badly wounded in falls from horses. The young king's tournament captain was William Marshall, who had been appointed Henry's tutor in weapons by Eleanor before the Great Revolt. Within a couple of years, he had become known as one of the greatest knights on the circuit, capturing many knights and their ransoms built his fortune. As I said, tournaments were dangerous, and Marshall nearly suffocated when he was hit so hard that his helmet was reversed and it had to be removed by a blacksmith. The tournaments usually lasted a single day, and there was roughly one tournament every two weeks during the tournament season, which was between the end of Lent, in early April, and the end of May. Tournaments were held in the countryside, away from large cities, because they involved hundreds, if not thousands, of knights, and were fought over areas covering miles of land. After the initial clash between the two sides, they would break up into smaller groups who would move around and use the terrain to try to ambush each other. The goal was to capture other knights, not just to win, but to obtain a ransom for the prisoner's release. Since these tournaments covered large areas, they were not designed for audiences. The knights basically performed for each other. Many of the lords lived in different regions, so the tournaments were vital networking opportunities. Actually, tournaments were good practice for warfare, which mostly consisted of rapid raids intended to burn the farms of an opponent's tenants to eliminate his economic base. During the Great Revolt, the Count of Flanders had defended the scorched earth policy, saying, first destroy the land, then one's foe. Unlike the fertile Henry, King Louis had needed to marry three times to produce a son, Philip, who was a sickly child, so when he became seriously ill at age 14, Louis sailed to England to pray at Becket's tomb to save his only son, and to prevent the Count of Champagne or Blois from ruling France. Not only were they his brothers-in-law, but they had married his daughters with Eleanor, becoming his sons-in-law. While the exact description of their relationship was confusing, they were his rivals and next in line for the throne after Philip. Fortunately, Philip recovered, but Louis suffered a stroke after his pilgrimage. Incapable of ruling, he held the public ceremony to crown Philip on November 1st, 1179. The coronation ceremony was conducted by the Archbishop of Rheims, who was the Queen's brother. The other prominent participants in the ceremony were the young King of England and the Count of Flanders, which symbolizes the three forces competing for influence with the French heir. Since Adela of Champagne was Philip's mother, the Champagne family should have played a leading role in young Philip's life. But Philip of Flanders was even more influential because he arranged the marriage of his niece Isabel of Hainault to Philip in April 1183 giving the region Artois as her dowry. Eager to free himself from his mother's influence, young Philip even took the royal seal from his ailing father to prevent its use by his mother. As the situation continued to deteriorate, Adela had to flee from Paris, and her brothers were forced to humble themselves and seek assistance from Henry, who was eager to foster peace, especially given young Philip's announcement that he would forcibly reclaim disputed lands in Normandy. When the two sides met at the end of June, Henry and his army were able to mend relations between Philip and his mother. Still, an alliance between Flanders and France would be dangerous, especially after Philip became king, in fact, when Louis died in September. Fortunately for Henry, King Philip began to quarrel with Count Philip and found himself in a difficult predicament, needing aid from the Angevin. Why would the King of France need help, you ask? Although he was their nominal overlord, the French king was poorer than his vassals in Flanders and Champagne. Flanders consisted of the northeastern edge of modern France and most of modern Belgium. A flourishing agriculture enabled a dense population and the growth of cities such as Ghent, Bruges, Ypres, and Arras. So the count had a surprisingly centralized government for the time and faced little trouble from independent lords. Count Philip built ports to connect interior cities like Bruges and Ypres with the channel, so Flanders became a trade route between England and France to Brabant and Germany, while the establishment of a rotating series of fairs, each lasting 30 days, increased domestic trade. 
In fact, as the thriving cities grew rich through trade, the nobles and knights lost status, driving many to serve foreign lords in the hopes of winning land and fortune. Aside from a booming economy, Philip acquired the county of Vemandois through marriage in 1167, doubling the size of his territory and moving his border to a mere dozen kilometers from Paris. The Champagne family, the Capetian's primary rival, had gained control of the counties of Champagne, Blois, and Sancerre, but they had less control over their domains than the Count of Flanders, and their counties were not actually located near each other. Responding to the young king's request for assistance, Henry and Henry the young king met with King Philip and Count Philip in April 1181 and negotiated a peace. Henry then left his heir in Normandy with full authority in order to ensure that peace. Regardless, war broke out between the Count and the King, and Count Philip was able to gather an impressive coalition of Flemish and French lords, including the Count of Sancerre, Adela's younger brother, signifying a temporary alliance between Flanders and Champagne. Young Henry led his forces and his brothers Richard and Joffrey to support the French King. Massive ravaging of the Count of Sancerre's lands forced him to submit to his nephew. However, the fighting flared up again when Philip's wife died in 1182. They had been estranged due to his accusations of adultery and had produced no children. Since he only held Valois and Vermandois through his wife, the lands should have gone to her younger sister Eleanor, but he refused to give them up. Eager to avoid further warfare, Henry and his son negotiated it an agreement between the Count and the King, where Eleanor received Valois, but Philip kept Vermandois during his lifetime. Despite this brief period of action, Henry's heir remained restless. His younger brothers had been rewarded with independent authority, while even his role as his father's deputy in Normandy was temporary. In the fall of 1182, the young king made a formal demand for Normandy, but only received an increase in his allowance. Believing that his father would never surrender any part of England, Anjou, or Normandy, the young king began to covet Aquitaine. Aware that Richard was not genuinely popular, young Henry began meddling in the duchy. One reason why Richard was unpopular was his adoption of his father's approach to estates with the young heirs. When Count Vulgrin of Angoulême died in 1181, leaving only his infant daughter Matilda, the estate should have been divided among the dead Count's brothers and Matilda. However, Richard followed the example of his father and decreed that the entire estate would go to Matilda, who would become his ward, allowing him to keep the revenue from her estate until he decided that she could marry. This blatant assault on the traditions of Aquitaine sparked, yes, another revolt, which would have probably failed like all of the previous revolts but the Angelin brothers paid homage to Philip, who wanted to make France great again. Support from the King of France transformed the situation, but it also attracted the attention of the old king. Faced with the combined forces of the king and his son, Philip withdrew his support, and the rebellious counts bent the knee. Furthermore, Richard's imposition of ducal authority threatened the interests of the lower level of nobles, basically minor nobles, constables of castles, and second sons of lords. In a state of constant warfare, the lesser nobles could hope for advancement in society through victory in battle. But Richard valued order and imposed a monopoly on violence. He employed mercenaries, but they were paid regularly so they did not loot and rape whenever the brief struggle they had been hired for had ended, and his vassals were not permitted to hire mercenaries. In fact, any mercenaries caught in Aquitaine who did not serve him were hunted down and killed. Like Richard, Joffrey was authorized to lead campaigns in Brittany to execute the king's will. Pressed to manage a sprawling federation, Henry allowed Joffrey to marry Constance, the heiress to Brittany, in July 1181, so he received lordship of most of Brittany. But Henry kept the county of Nantes and the earldom of Richmond in England. When Joffrey married Constance, two things happened. He gained actual power, and he realized that Henry would not give him all of his lands in the near future, and possibly never. 
Henry was reluctant to give everything to Joffrey because the combined revenues of the Duchy of Brittany, the County of Nantes, and the estate of Richmond in England would give Joffrey enough wealth to defy his father. Although Joffrey only began to govern in 1181, he had spent years imposing his father's will. Aware that he was in danger of being resented as an occupier, he worked to please his barons, thus winning their support. Given the far greater number of charters issued during Joffrey's rule, and the number of charters issued during Henry's absentee lordship from 1158 to 1181, he was clearly personally involved in the government. Most important, Joffrey steadily replaced his father's officials with local men and even extended ducal authority to remote areas that had avoided Henry's control. When Henry refused to give Constance her inheritance of Richmond, Joffrey attacked his father's men in the city of Varennes in 1182. As expected, Henry sent an army into Brittany to crush the revolt. But Joffrey resisted until father and son were somehow reconciled in June. While Richard and Joffrey had gained control over their duchies, Henry the Younger still had no practical experience of ruling, a troubling situation for a stable kingdom, never mind the sprawling, complex Angevin territories. Numerous contemporary observers described him as shallow, but that is the fault of his father, who had never given him a territory to rule, a place where he would have to learn from his mistakes. Always in debt, preferring to play at war in tournaments, the young king proved uninterested in tedious sieges or administration. Instead, he surrounded himself with young men who were also waiting for their fathers to die and toadied to him since he was their patron. It is probably inaccurate to say that Henry intended to create an Angevin empire since England, Normandy, Anjou, Brittany, and Aquitaine had separate administrations. The best description of the Angevin territories is a federation, more like a family-controlled consortium. But who could guarantee that the son's interests would not diverge in the future? John was an unknown factor, but it was debatable whether Richard and Joffrey would want to follow the lead of Henry the Younger when their father died. Since they had maintained control of their lands on their own, it seemed unlikely that they would acknowledge their older brother as king as they had their father, thus ending the mighty Angevin Federation. Henry clearly had that worry since he summoned all of his children and barons to a Christmas celebration in 1182 in order to establish the inheritance, primarily the requirement for Richard and Joffrey to pay homage to their brother for their duchies of Aquitaine and Brittany. The Christmas celebration did not go according to plan. Richard refused to swear fealty to his older brother, claiming that as Duke of Aquitaine, he was a vassal to the King of France, just as Henry was for Normandy, which was an accurate description of his status. Richard had received Aquitaine from his mother, it was not part of the Angevin Federation, and he refused the King's blatant attempt to make it part of that Federation. To make matters worse, young Henry had interfered in the duchy, promising lords better treatment if they pledged allegiance to him. Young Henry needed an excuse to directly oppose his brother, and he thought he found it when Richard began building a castle and town in territory disputed between Anjou and Aquitaine. An exasperated Henry convinced Richard to hand over the disputed castle and then twisted his son's arms to swear eternal peace with each other, which they apparently did with a straight face. Realizing that the dispute between Richard's vassals and Richard needed to be resolved, Henry sent Joffrey to invite the vassals to a peace conference. Instead, Joffrey joined them, hired mercenaries, and began ravaging Richard's lands. It seems unlikely that he would do this on his own, so he had probably made previous arrangements with young Henry. Richard had complied with his father's demands to keep family harmony, only to have the young king plot against him. Furious, he stormed out of the castles, leaving only insults behind him. Rather than recognize that Richard had been provoked by the heir, Henry was angered by the defiance and permitted young Henry and Joffrey to discipline their brother. So more peasants would have their farms burned because of a family squabble. Young Henry joined with repeat rebels, the Viscounts and Counts of Limoges, Angoulême, Pedigord, and Lusignan, 
Aside from recruiting many of the young knights who had served him in tournaments, young Henry hired numerous mercenaries, which was not hard since southern France was swarming with them, usually Brabacon, Basque, Navarrese, and Catalans. Many had served Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa during his wars in northern Italy, but they had been downsized after the Treaty of Venice in 1177. Fortunately, Count Raymond of Toulouse and his enemies, the Count of Bezier and the King of Aragon, frequently hired mercenaries for their endless wars against each other. In between contracts, bands of mercenaries kept themselves in food and wine by plundering the lands of weaker lords. Their devastation caused such fury that the Third Lateran Council declared that any force which opposed those mercenaries and was guided by a bishop or a priest would be considered equal to two years of penance. Outnumbered by the forces of Brittany, rebels in Aquitaine, and the young king, Richard adopted harsh measures. Catching a force of mercenaries by surprise on February 12th, he killed many and then took his prisoners to the other side of a river within sight of Limoges, where Viscount Amar, young Henry, and Joffrey watched him execute some of the prisoners and blind the rest. Mercenaries were considered disposable, but Richard shocked everyone when he announced that any knight in the household of either the young king or Joffrey would be executed immediately rather than held for ransom. Despite his skill and ruthlessness, Richard might have lost, but the old king was welcomed with arrows when he attempted to enter Limoges to talk to his heir. The garrison claimed that they had not recognized his standard but when he rode to meet with Joffrey and his heir, an arrow narrowly missed him. Rather than reassure Henry, the young king openly treated his father with suspicion and refused to appease a justifiably angry king by handing over some expendable soldiers to be executed as an example. Instead, he permitted Viscount Emar to swear fealty to him and to fortify Limoges, which is bizarre behavior for an intermediary. Clearly, he had rebelled again. Caught off guard, Henry had to wait in growing anger for his feudal armies in Anjou and Normandy to gather and to hire his own mercenaries. He also arranged for help from Alfonso of Aragon. Once he had sufficient troops, he began a siege of Limoges on March 1st. Young Henry's plan, if he had one, is unclear and he was probably reacting to events rather than guiding them. To be honest, the young king seemed to be basically taking one side in a turf war in Aquitaine, but was making no effort to broaden the insurrection. King Philip paid for a large force of mercenaries to aid his brother-in-law, but did not officially move against Henry. During an emotional meeting between father and son, young Henry vowed to go on crusade, which made sense since he was in a horrible position. He had publicly committed himself to help the rebels against Richard, but his father had become involved, greatly raising the stakes. If he abandoned the rebels, his reputation would suffer a fatal blow, but he knew that he could not oppose his father and Richard, even with Joffrey as an ally. To be honest, going on crusade was the time-honored method of getting out of a difficult political situation. Henry approved his heir's plans and agreed to treat the rebel lords with mercy. However, the king's emissaries to the rebels were threatened, and some were killed. Later chroniclers tried to blame the young king, but do not provide dates or specifics. So it seems that someone, either Joffrey or, more likely, the rebels, tried to wreck the chance for peace. Probably well aware of the king's attitude towards mercy. Their efforts succeeded, since the level of trust between father and son was too weak to bear any more problems. Young Henry returned to the siege, and Henry resolved to crush the rebels. Neither man was willing to make an effort to resolve the real problem between them, so more people would die. The siege was a question of will and resources, and the young king may have had will, but definitely lacked his father's seemingly inexhaustible resources. There were no uprisings in England because Henry had sent orders to arrest everyone who would oppose him during the Great Revolt and ordered the arrest of loyal earls like the Earl of Gloucester as well, just to make sure. However, Henry was having trouble keeping the feudal levies in the frustrating siege of a major town, so many left for home. Once enough troops had deserted, 
Henry abandoned the siege in order to focus on protecting Normandy from the French or Count Philip of Flanders. Meanwhile, the young king kept his mercenaries satisfied through forced loans from abbeys. He needed the money since he was planning an offensive in cooperation with his new allies Raymond of Toulouse and Odo, eldest son of Duke Hugh of Burgundy. However, while waiting to meet his allies, he became ill with dysentery, so he had to postpone his offensive. Unfortunately, he died on June 11, 1183. Given past experience, Henry feared a trap and did not visit his dying son. Learning of his death, the old king resolved to crush the rebels and continued the siege at Limoges until Viscount Emar surrendered on June 24th. Aided by Alfonso of Aragon, Richard then routed Raymond of Toulouse, ending the revolt. Henry the Younger had simply managed to stir up more trouble and resentment before he died. Everyone on both sides was shocked. People had expected that he would rule sooner or later, and since he had spent all of his time playing the role of chivalric knight without the unpleasant work of collecting taxes or enforcing the law, he was naturally popular. Just before he died, his tournament champion, William Marshall, swore to go on crusade in his name. To be honest, the entire situation was Henry's fault, since he had made no effort to prepare his heir, unlike Eleanor, who had raised Richard to rule. I will explain how Henry handled the death of his heir and the need to adjust the inheritances of his remaining three sons in the next episode. Thanks for listening.